thinking some thoughts today on perspective as it goes to our life in God, our one and only God and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our our everything. And I had several ideas, several visuals, and it came to my mind in regards to perspective and the way we humans can look at things from a lens that has what are known as presuppositions. For instance, in the world, there is a presupposition that we know, quote unquote, we know that uh, man came into being and has progressed to the point he is through evolution. So they start off from that standpoint. We know evolution is the process. So now let's apply that fact to every piece of evidence we find as opposed to uh, let's figure out how things work and how we got to where we are. Maybe it's evolution. I don't know. Maybe there's a creator. Let's figure it out. Let's seek. Let's find. It's not a search for truth in that context. It's uh, It becomes a search for confirmation of something one already believes. And unfortunately in religion, uh, which is another form of worldliness, another form of carnal man imposing his thoughts on something, and in this case, not on the physical realm, but man imposing his carnal thoughts and beliefs on God. And in religion, we, quote, unquote, again, we know, unquote, that God is a vengeful, angry God just waiting to punish you. So we look at the scriptures through that lens. And maybe even a lot of the scriptures were written, transcribed, translated through that lens, as opposed to the living, loving God who allows people to choose something other than him and, and get something that's very bad, something called hell, something called darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. But nevertheless, God gets no pleasure from that. It's not something he's hoping for. And the Bible does clearly indicate that. So I was just wanted to talk a minute about the perspective and how, you know, forgive me those who use the lemons to lemonade process of thinking. I'm not trying to say I've come up with something brand new. I know it's just not invented a concept. I'm not inventing a concept right now. Uh, I just want to apply it to the reality that is God. For he stood here in the flesh and told us, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way to heaven. The truth about everything that is pertinent to that way and that life. And uh, so it's extraordinarily important to really understand what he's saying because there's only one truth. There's many interpretations, but there's only one truth. So you can say, for instance, if you tear a plant out of the ground, let's say you grabbed it at the base and you yanked it out of the ground and flipped it upside down and held out those roots and the dirt that's clumped to them and the bugs and the worms and everything that's hanging on and working and living and doing what it's doing and say, there's a flower. Look at it. You say you love flowers. Well, there it is. That's what flowers are. And to a certain extent, you could say it's true because without that, all that, even including the bugs and the worms and certainly the dirt and the roots, the flower would never be. But that's not the essence of the flower. 
And I'm not comparing God to the flower or the plant. I'm comparing us to that in that God does not look at us, flip us upside down or inside out maybe, and look at the roots of your heart with all that dirt and bugs and worms crawling around and go, look, that's who you are. Clean it up, you disgusting thing. He he looks on he looks on the reflection that hopefully someday we will reflect that is being him and says I love you I made you I made you to be beautiful and you're beautiful in my sight and you are my flower but you have things going on and that's real and I don't deny that, but that's not who you are. It's not the essence of who you are. Who you are is mine. You're my child. You're my son. You are my daughter. You are the one that I am using all that dirt and bugs and worms and roots through my work and your trust to turn into this beautiful flower. So don't focus on all that. Focus on me. Focus on who I am and my great love for you, my great acceptance, and my hands will do what only they can do. You're not going to change anything to try to be good, and you're not going to change anything through constantly confessing how bad you are. This is not something that's going to happen through your pride or your guilt. It's simply going to happen through trusting in me and knowing how much I love you. And you're never going to trust in that perfectly. So now you might say, well, Mark, geez, then, then who can be saved? There's another way of asking who can be saved. The disciples asked when they saw that the rich man couldn't be saved. They thought the rich man was blessed because he was a good person. And that's what God does. He blesses good people. In this case, I just said, well, who can have perfect faith? And it requires faith. To be saved, it requires faith for God to come and live in you. But part of the faith is, is acknowledging it. God, I don't trust you. I don't, but I know I need to. I know you're my only hope. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron contradiction, however you want to put that. But it's not. That, that's the capability we humans have. We have something that's called co-perception. doesn't make us two people. We are not a... Uh, a conglomeration of people, just like our God is not. Our God is not a conglomeration of people. He's an individual. He has a right to be an individual, just like you and just like me, all those he made. And so I can co-perceive. I can consider two things at once. And, I, and in, a, in a way, I can be two things at once. God can be very angry and yet very merciful. It doesn't mean he's confused. It doesn't mean he's a schizophrenic. It just means that he knows that we deserve certain things but he desires other things for us. He desires mercy for us. And so I can look at myself, so to speak, and say, well, I know I need to trust God. I will choose to trust God. Even before I fully trust in him, I've made that choice. And that is the doorway that allows him to come in and take all my dirt and roots and bugs and worms and start turning it into that flower or that squash or that melon or whatever it is I'm supposed to be and, and, and do it alone. Apart from, from my decision, it is a work of God alone. I, that initial decision really is where it all happens and me getting out of the way. But again, I'm not trying to say I'm, I'm all evil. I know we're born in sin. And as such, there's nothing good in me. But not from the standpoint of I'm pure evil. It's just that I'm more like a canvas. Again, you got to consider. you got to re-look at things and consider what ty type of presupposition have you been putting on the Scriptures all your life. He says there's none good, no, not one. He's not saying that you are just filled with evil. It's just that we make decisions. We make decisions and we have certain tendencies. We do because of our flesh. 
but those decisions are who we are from a standpoint of, you know, the one who chose God is just, they're just a good person. The one who didn't choose God is just a bad person. No, there are two people that decide to make two different choices and let God identify them for who they are. I either believe and trust in the fact that I am a child of God, or I don't. And I can be a lot of other things. I can be a child of Satan, child of the world, my own self-made man, you know, whatever I decide to be. And, and all those other things besides the child of God are temporary. They will come and they will go. I will come and I will go. But I will have my eternal life only in Him when my identity is in Him, when I trust in Him. He takes care of the details. I simply trust that He'll make a good decision. I don't know when I was quote-unquote saved. Maybe I'm not saved yet. I like to think I am. I really do believe that I am saved. The thing is, though, is I have to trust that He'll make a right decision in it no matter what. Same thing with my loved ones. Same thing with everything else, everyone else in the world. Not to the end that I don't, I don't have to tell you one about him. I love to tell people about him because I, I know now more than I ever have in my life that my God loves me, that he loves this clump of dirt and roots and weeds, well, excuse me, <laughs> worms and, and bugs. And, and it's not in spite of me. And it's not because he thinks those things are beautiful. It's because he made me and he made you too. And this little talk is just for you to consider that your God loves you. And look at the scriptures through that lens. Look at the world through that lens. And start to realize that it isn't what you thought it was. It isn't what they told you. He's not the big, the big boogeyman in the sky with a stick in one hand and the basket of blessings in the other, waiting to smack you or bless you according to your behavior. He is your father. And he knows absolutely what's best for you in everything. And he's already given you everything. But you've been lied to from the moment you were born. And you've been told that if you want flowers, you better go out and get some. You better go out and pick some. You better go out and plant some. You better... And in the context of religion, you, you better uh, do this and do that and don't do that and don't do that. It's all about you. Either way, the world or religion, it's all about you. It's all about the individual. What do I do to attain, to obtain what I want and to avoid what I don't want? What do I, 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 I do not do? That's religion. A life in God is, thank you, Jesus. You are my God. You did everything. Bless your holy name. Bless you. I just want to know you more. And for the rest of my life, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn of you more. I'm going to rest in that love. And whenever I get an opportunity and you guide me, I'm going to tell people about you. Because all I know is you are good. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name.